Hello, everyone. Welcome to our talk. Uh, with me today, I have Yup Iskar uh, from GigaOM. Uh, my name is Rajiv Thakkar, and I represent Portworx by Pure Storage. Yup, welcome to our talk on platform engineering. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, you know, you know, obviously, you know, you and I have worked together in the past, Yup, and we talk about. DevOps a lot and platform engineering a lot and you know Kubernetes storage a lot, uh, but I thought we can uh, give our viewers a bit of a zoom into the world of platform engineering and how this function has evolved in all organizations going forward. It's it's quite a mainstream function uh, for innovation, right? Uh, what's your perspective on this platform engineering team uh, uh, from your point of view? Right, right. So I, I think platform engineering is still very close to DevOps. Um, it's kind of a different way of achieving the same goals, the same outcomes, because DevOps really was about, you know, um, lessening the distance between Dev and Ops, meaning we could deliver software, you know, faster, quicker, more often, et cetera. Now, the operations part of this was always important, right? So, you know, once you deliver a piece of software, it still has to run, and that's kind of the gap that platform engineering is closing. It's still about dev, it's still about ops, but it is about creating a service internally mm -hmm. that allows you know, development teams to deliver software and run it. Um, so these platforms are called uh, internal dev platforms, internal development platforms. And really what they do is they take what's out there in the market, combine it in a smart way, create a service out of it, quote unquote, so that a dev team can get started quickly, can deliver quickly, and you know can um, put software their software into production and keep it there, keep it reliant, keep it secure, keep it performant. Mm -hmm. Very well said. I, I'm glad you mentioned IDP because you know these internal dev platforms are so core to what a platform engineering team builds and continues to build every single day. And I think whenever I talk to you know the head of platform engineering teams at multiple companies or platform architects who are very instrumental to making you know architectural choices that go into an IDP right and making investments uh, for their developer teams to actually have the tools they need to build build the apps uh, that are building the future of their organization I think one thing that's uh, always resonating to me is all platform engineering teams are looking to build sort of a practice that has a cloud model it a cloud operating model and an experience that's sort of giving that on-demand self-service experience for all of the pieces of the dev platform. Um, could you talk a little bit about that uh, as well? You mentioned speed, uh, you know, that's kind of related uh, to having this cloud operating model. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, there's so many elements to this, right? Uh, and if it were easy, it would have been a solved problem already. Um, unfortunately, it's not. We're in the middle of this. So yes, it's you know it's a fairly accepted rule. Um, there's a fairly well thought out definition of all of this, but it's still in in terms of maturity, it's still evolving. It's still very much changing year over year, uh, which also means it's it's kind of hard to grasp. But what are the most important things that we should care about, right? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's infrastructure. Um, you know, software still runs on hardware. Surprise, surprise. So we need to care about all of that. But it's kind of the layer cake that is built on top of it, like the public clouds have done with their service offerings, that we're now kind of seeing being replicated. Uh, and kind of, you know, all of these different tools from that toolbox are being slotted into a very opinionated single platform that people can use. Um, so instead of giving you know people the public cloud toolbox and, and say hey go go have at it, figure it out, we're now creating these platforms and making those decisions to make very opinionated platforms the IDPs, um, and and that means, um, it you know we we're still creating platforms that have uh, very much the dev tooling aspect of it, so it's still very much aimed at developers mm -hmm. and everything they need to put you know put software into production. Mm -hmm. So that's CI CD pipelines, that is Git repositories, that is observability to see how their software is doing, uh, to make adjustments to troubleshoot. It's very much, uh, you know, security scanning pre-production. So making sure images are safe and have been scanned to create as bombs, et cetera, et cetera. 
but it's also very much the operational part, making sure that once we're in production, that we have the tooling to be performant, to be secure, to be compliant, to, to be able to do blue green deployments, et cetera, et cetera. And so, like I said, you know, the, the list goes on and on. This is very much still a work in progress as to what we need to put into an IDP, but we're at least kind of seeing the outlines of what used to be very much the pipeline CICD area, the very dev focused, pre production focused area now being combined with the productionizing of these apps, making sure that they actually are able to, uh, you know, to run in production and stay there. Yeah, no, very well said. I agree. And I think the point of view that you're bringing is that, you know, while they are building IDPs, they have to make sure that there's continuous app development happening by developers and the security policies are, are still, you know, dynamic and, and, you know, always, always available to make sure apps are built securely. Uh, I think one thing that we're also noticing, you know, which is what you reemphasized is that, you know, the cloud actually, you know, taught us how you can bring services uh, to consumers and users yeah. of services, right? And infrastructure is now not something that developer teams care about. They just expect it to be available, right? And that's that's what the cloud taught us. So having that operating model everywhere, whether it's for, you know, storage or networking or compute or even databases or, or you know, for your app tooling and, you know, dev DevOps services to just do test, test and dev or, or even for security, right? Is just a you know, standard expectation that is uh, from every platform engineering team out there when they build IDPs. Uh, the other nuance that I want to add here, you is because there is so much choice in you know choosing a cloud provider, or also due to sometimes availability of a cloud provider in certain regions across the world, because most most platform engineering teams actually build a global practice and an IDP that's global. They have to think about you know, residency needs and also uh, their data uh, residency needs as it relates to a service availability from a cloud provider or even, you know, a, a specific on-prem vendor for infrastructure. So we've seen IDPs being built with this mentality of platform engineering that is, you know, uh, build once, um, run anywhere and uh, port anywhere, right? So it's it's this concept of, how do I build an IDP that is truly cloud neutral, right? No matter what investments or constraints I have from one region to the other in a specific cloud provider or an infra provider, the IDP should still deliver that same experience everywhere. Yeah, uh, I, I like that because especially, you know, no cloud is the same, right? Um, so some clouds are better at databases, some clouds are better at, uh, I don't know, message queues, some other are better at bare metal services. So you don't necessarily want to just use one cloud. Mm -hmm. And very realistically, you're not, you're probably multi-cloud, you're using multiple clouds. Um, but then kind of integrating the different pieces that you use from each of those clouds becomes an issue. And the IDP is uniquely positioned to help solve that problem, because now you're kind of creating an overlay at least from a usability standpoint, so that all of these different services from all of these different clouds can be used in a single portal, uh, making it so much easier to consume all of these services. Because that's kind of a thought that's been sticking in the back of my mind. We went from you know on-prem to DevOps to platform engineering, cloud is somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. um, and the beauty of an IDP is that you know people that are knowledgeable make the choice for a certain set of features or a certain set of products for that specific area. Meaning that I, as a developer, no longer have to think about, okay, am I gonna use you know, RDS as my database layer or am I going to do something else? Am I going to use you know, S3 or am I gonna use something else? All of these choices have been made already for me by the experts so I can just get on with my work, right? And I don't need to provision a database um, from scratch, I can just point and click somewhere in the IDP and then, you know, automatically a database instance shows up. And like that's that's kind of the ma magic of having an IDP one, but also selecting the vendors that are able to deliver on those services, right? Yeah, no, very well said. I agree. And, uh, you know, one other thing that I think platform engine teams also care about you is this, you know, enterprise grade capabilities and really the platform's resiliency because you know these apps while they may be containerized you know they are truly you know stateful apps 
And you know, initially folks were building stateless apps on containers due to the nature of containers. But you know, Portworks has been the leader in this area for deploying stateful apps uh, on, on Kubernetes and you know, helped multiple customers from all verticals you know, achieve that sort of zero RPO uh, when deploying Kubernetes apps. You know, these modern apps have delivered some game-changing experiences, uh, including in the pandemic where you know, vaccines were uh, being, you know, delivered and, you know, at, at, at light speed, right? And that's just one example from the healthcare industry because of what we went through um, uh, due to COVID and, and, you know, all the needs of the entire human population where there was a need to accelerate bringing a new vaccine to the market. And we've helped multiple healthcare providers, you know, build that kind of a platform, which is not only fast, has self-service, but also this resiliency where there's full fault tolerance, right? If one data center or storage uh, goes down, your apps are still, you know, unaffected because, you know, that's that's where stateless comes in. So how important is uh, these stateful applications, uh, which are, you know, built on containers that are stateless, mm -hmm. right, by nature, uh, when it comes to building an IDP from your point of view? I think that's crucial. I mean, we yes, we started out with stateless apps on on containers, both because it was technically, you know, what we could do, um, and especially the storage side of Kubernetes wasn't as mature back in you know the early days. Um, but also, we quickly realized that almost no app is stateless, because what do applications do? They process data, right? That's that really, if you look at it, that's all they do, and that you know that makes infrastructure and storage specifically, one of the bedrocks of all of this. Like all, all we do with cloud native, with cloud, with IDPs, with platform engineering, all of this simply comes down to you know having these resources available in a way that makes them consumable by the developer directly. And so that's why I love writing um, the work that I uh, write for GigaOM, um, specifically, specifically around Kubernetes data storage is because we take something very fundamental that I know, you know, I've been trained as a, as a storage engineer and we apply it in a way that is very abstracted for the developer to consume directly. And so one of the biggest uh, or the best examples of this is PDS as a Perkworks data services mm -hmm. where, you know, you're just as a developer, just able to deploy a database on storage somewhere and it happens. You don't need to think about it. Like that for a developer is, is just fantastic. Right. But it's it's so it's super interesting to me to see that it's still very much dependent on these lower layers of actual infrastructure, yeah. uh, but applied in a way that is, you know, self-service, on-demand. It's easy to deploy. Someone has actually thought about it, you know, someone who's the expert and made same default choices for security, for performance, for scaling, for, you know, whatever. And that expertise is you know, kind of codified, put into the templates and into the defaults. So I, as a developer, no longer have to think about that. Like, and that's kind of where I hope an IDP as a concept will evolve to, mm -hmm. that vendors like Portworks provide their expertise, codify it, put it into software, and deliver it as part of an IDP so that your expertise can now be used by whoever's using an IDP, right? That's kind of my ideal state, you know, maybe two to five years or two to three years in, into the future. Um, so that we can actually use all of this expertise, all of these different vendor uh, vendors have like that. That would be ideal. Oh, lovely! I like how you framed it, and you know, thanks, thanks for bringing uh, you know data storage into the conversation. Obviously, that's very close to us and uh, what we do here at at Portworks as we're building that platform as well to deliver these services to platform engineering teams and and you know sort of help make the IDP successful for the data storage needs. So if I were to summarize kind of the five care abouts of platform engineering teams based on our discussions for the you for the users here and viewers, uh, I think it's, you know, if I may say it's all about, you know, building that cloud operating model, which is kind of neutral in the sense where whatever organizational choices are made uh, by the CIOs or CTO teams to invest in multiple clouds or on-prem and hybrid environments, the IDP kind of supports that bringing the same experience everywhere for infrastructure and that operating model is common at, at the same time you know all of the classic enterprise grade requirements around security 
you know, uh, resiliency and stateful apps uh, that will be deployed on containers. All of those have to be remembered. And, and these are things that platform engineering teams will care about, including uh, the newness, uh, you know, that uh, platform engineering teams and developers need, right? Which is self-service access to everything. So they can do continuous app development and also the flexibility to build once and, and you know, run it everywhere and also port it when necessary. So uh, really enjoyed this conversation, Hube. And could you uh, transition uh, a little bit to kind of the criteria you used for Kubernetes data storage? The radars have come out. So I'm glad yep. the viewers can download it and everything. Absolutely. So again, I mean, we're still talking about storage, right? Uh, even in a cloud native world. So we're kind of assuming things like, you know, it, it has snapshots its performance, it's, you know, it has some kind of data optimization um, technology or multiple of them in there. So a lot of them, you know, we just assume are there because, you know, it's still storage, that's kind of table stakes, right? Um, but we do specifically look for um, certain features if we're talking about Kubernetes data storage solutions. And those are solutions that don't necessarily run on Kubernetes, although co-locating would be nice from an architectural point of view makes it much more flexible, easier to deploy. Uh, but what we're specifically looking at is solutions that offer storage to Kubernetes environments. And so that means the integration between Kubernetes and the storage environment kind of has to go both ways. And that integration has to be top notch so that the storage environment knows that they're talking to a Kubernetes cluster with you know, certain pods or um, certain storage classes, et, et, et cetera. Um, and then kind of by extension, we need to have some kind of CSI compatibility for various reasons, you know, cloning, snapshotting, et cetera, um, so that we can expose those functionalities that the storage platform already has directly to the Kubernetes users, to the developers. Because in a lot of cases, it's the developers that want to create a snapshot. And if they have to call someone or, you know, file a support ticket that says, hey, go make me a snapshot, please doesn't make sense, right? We want it to be self-service, on-demand. And so that's why we look for these kind of integrations. Um, and then naturally, this kind of extends into data replication as well. Yes, we assume data replication is part of the solution, but it hasn't been exposed to Kubernetes. Can we leverage those replication services directly from a Kubernetes you know, a YAML file or a kubectl or whatever, so that the user itself, so the developer, can take advantage of those features instead of having to go through a storage admin. Um, lastly, kind of that extends naturally into data footprint optimization. So some kind of compression, dedupe, et cetera, because it's still storage. Uh, you know, we, we assume it's uh, able to be optimized to, uh, to make for a better uh, solution overall in terms of cost. Um, and then we're, we also very much look at telemetry, visibility, observability, insights, st stuff like that from a couple of different perspectives. Um, so firstly, we want to know that our storage infrastructure is healthy and, you know, we don't run out of physical space, et cetera, et cetera. The cloud solves part of, it, of this, of course, but in an on-prem environment, that is still very important. Uh, but also we want to give information about the performance of applications specifically back to the user, back to the app developer. Um, so having that layer of integration and visibility uh, is also very uh, important. And then lastly, and I'll touch on this a little bit because you know this whole webinar is about developer experience. Mm -hmm. But we take a, an overall look at how well the developer can interact with the storage environment directly or indirectly. Uh, because again, that's kind of a key factor for successful adoption of specifically a storage solution for Kubernetes. Because you know, the user of Kubernetes is the developer and not necessarily the storage admin. Understood. No, thank you. Thanks for re-emphasizing all of your evaluation criteria. And, you know, Portworks is, is very honored uh, to be recognized by Gigom amongst other uh, players in the space. And uh, we continue to focus on, you know, building our platform to serve all of these needs. And, and, you know, hope that we, uh, you know, rec recognize in the future as well uh, as we solve joint customer problems to bring stateful apps uh, to market on Kubernetes storage, keeping all these requirements in mind. 
for platform engineering teams. Hugh, I uh, would like to thank you for joining us today and for everyone as well uh, to listen to us uh, in this webinar. If you want to download uh, the cloud native storage uh, and enterprise uh, Kubernetes storage uh, radars from GeekOM, uh, please visit putworks.com uh, and you'll, you'll see the link uh, right there to download them. Thank you again, Hugh. You're welcome. That was fun. All righty. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.